Right. So as we thought about how to have this conversation about race, ethnicity, and religion, um, it became really important for us as a faculty to think about ourselves as students in the process. Uh, we at SFPS, like every community, have a storied um, past. We have, mo like most communities around the world, have wrestled with issues of race, ethnicity, and religion. And so um, the semester is really set up to take, for all of us as a community to take seriously um, the problems, issues, and gifts that come from living in a diverse community. Uh, so, the way that the, the syllabus for the semester is set up is that in each of the, the months, we are going to be dealing with a different concept. So, in the month of September, we're really going to focus on issues of white supremacy and white fragility. Uh, because oftentimes when we have conversations about race, particularly in the United States, we skip over whiteness as an assumed reality. And so, we really have to be intentional about naming some of the issues that are at play. Um, in this community and across the world. We'll then move into October and start to have a conversation about black studies. Um, we have a great lineup of, of people. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And then for the month of November, we'll talk about Latinx studies, a group of Latino, Latina scholars who are coming in to lead those conversations. So what um, what was also important is that because conversations about race and ethnicity and religion are all changing, uh, this is a, a new generation of scholars, people who um, are scholar practitioners who've been doing this work very intentionally but um, have not been in the academy for as long, right? So we have a, a younger generation of scholars coming in to, to lead this conversation. And in part, it was important to have people from outside of the community because there are hard things that need to be said, and we need to be able to process and hear those things uh, objectively and not bring our own kind of woundedness, brokenness into that space. Um, one of the things that we as a faculty would, would ask you all to do is live in the moment of the conversation that we are having. Uh, we understand that what is on this syllabus does not represent the whole of our community. We are getting there. It is not that the end of the semester marks the end of the conversation. We are having really intentional conversations about what happens next semester to build on this work and so that everybody has the opportunity to see some aspect of their identity represented in the work that we're doing here. Um, so, so just live in the moment. Um, so that we're not uh, fracturing conversations in ways that don't allow particular groups of identity groups to be heard and seen. That's the difficult work that we're going to do over the course of the semester. Um, so we'll talk about, uh, as the semester progresses, I'll talk a little bit about these scholars who are going to be with us, but they represent the fields of theology, homiletics. Um, we have some scholars who are religious sociologists. We have some scholars who are not religious scholars, but who um, deal in human development and psychology. And so we're hoping that this will be a really robust conversation. The things that are different about this semester than previous semester. Uh, the lectures will be, themselves will be shorter. Uh, the lectures will be about 45 minutes. We'll have some time for question and answer. And then at the end of every class, you will meet in small groups that are listed at the end of the syllabus. So take note of what small group that you, you are in. And um, those small groups should exist across race, ethnicity, gender, uh, and different identity orientations. And they're uh, intended to let you have some more intentional conversation and to begin to do your final project. So this is the big difference. You are all used to writing this wonderful final paper that we as faculty love, love, love to read as much as you love, love, love to write them. Stop, Marsha. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but this semester, instead of the final paper, we're asking you to do a small group presentation. So the group that you are in this semester will track with you throughout the semester um, so that uh, the last class, you will each do a 20-minute presentation uh, where you produce some kind of practical resource that takes seriously the work that we do over the course of the semester. We'll do that final project, we'll present it in 20 minutes, and then um, we'll have 10 minutes for the class to give uh, feedback, ask questions for each group, and that is what the final grade will be based on, rather than the paper. 
Um, I also ask you to take note of the readings that are listed under each lecture. They're not under everyone, but the, uh, some of our presenters have asked you to do a set of readings. Most of those readings are already on Moodle. Um, and a large amount of the lectures uh, for people who have listed them will assume that you've done the reading, so it really is incumbent upon you uh, to do that work. So, that being said, uh, let me ask if there are any questions. Jeremiah. So, if I'm not on this list, and then this, even, uh, when, even when people are visiting, like what, what, what do they do as far as jumping in a group? Uh, so, uh, that's a good question. This, that means that the final version of the syllabus didn't make it on here. You should, you are on the list, and I'll get you a copy of that. Um, and if you are visiting in, in the lecture, what we're asking is that you come in for that first hour and participate in the lecture portion and the question and answer portion, but that we hold that last half hour as sacred for the small group. If, if lecturers decide to break people up in groups as a part of their lecture portion, then people should jump into those groups quite equitably, but that last half hour is really your sacred time. Um, and, and some of the work that we're gonna do today is about building some space around those groups so that uh, there are rules that govern the best conversation. Other questions? If you came in late uh, after I took attendance, be sure and see me. So, seeing no questions, I'm excited and elated to uh, <laughs> begin the series um, with our first guest speaker, Shonda Jha, who is the founder and executive director of the Oakland Peace Center, which is a group of which is an organization that brings together 40 or so um, organizations to uh, take seriously issues of justice, peace, and equity um, in the Bay Area, but her work is global. Uh, Shonda is a, a prolific writer. She has published, uh, one of my favorite books is Pre-Post-Racial America, and it is listed as one of the, um, I published weekly as one of the top five books on race and religion. Uh, and so Shonda is going to guide us through a conversation about uh, how to have difficult conversations about race so that we have some groundwork to have conversations moving forward. Thanks so much. So uh, I'm a Disciples of Christ pastor and one of the anti-racism trainers for the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. And Part of what got me into the work was, well, no, that's a lie. I was already in the work when I learned this story. Um, I used to be better known for doing congregational transformation work, where I would work with churches that were dying, help them reconnect to their community, help them find new life. And I was sitting next to my former boss at a meeting last year, and we were talking to a mutual friend of ours. And Matt, my former boss, said to our friend, Shonda was one of the best congregational transformation consultants we had. And any time I sent an email to a congregation saying the consultant that will be visiting you is S-A-N-D-H-Y-A-J-H-A, I would almost immediately get a phone call from the pastor saying, we think you sent us the wrong consultant. We're a white church in Burlingame, Iowa, or in Connecticut, or in central Illinois. We need an American to help us figure out what's next. And Matt said, my response would be, it's pronounced Shonda, you'll love her, she'll be arriving on such and such date. And he said the phone call afterwards was always, you were right, she was great. And it's kind of a telling story about the context of my church that a church that is looking to live and thrive doesn't recognize somebody with the name spelled S-A-N-D-H-Y-A -A as someone who could possibly have something to contribute to that conversation. So I always find that a helpful illustration of kind of why the work matters in the life of my church. I'm sure all of the churches you come from don't have those problems, so this is gonna be a much easier process for the rest of you. But to just plunge us straight into a little bit of conversation, when we go into the kind of ground rules for healthy conversation, 
one of the things I'm going to suggest that we step into is something sometimes referred to as brave space. Right? We often talk about creating safe spaces for conversation. My experience has been that people with a little bit more privilege in a conversation, whenever they feel uncomfortable, will say they feel unsafe. And so I've started over the past 10 years or so borrowing a term called brave space, where we take the risks of stepping into conversations that are a little outside of our comfort zone so that we can get to some deeper truths. And we do that in love and we do that with a lot of trust. And so I'm gonna invite us to start out with a little bit of brave space for this conversation. I know this configuration of people hasn't been together before and over the course of this semester, you're gonna grow in trust and in relationship. But I'd like to invite you in a moment to get into groups of three and just share with each other one of your earliest memories related to race. I'm not gonna define that for you any further than that. This whole semester is gonna be about that process of defining race and ethnicity and wrestling with the definition of religion. Part of the reason I think it's worth doing is because in this process, everybody's got stories. Some of them are immediately at the front of, forefront of our minds, and for some of us it's gonna take a little more digging, but all of us have stories. And so I'm gonna buy you a little bit of time right now by telling you one of my stories. You don't actually have to listen, you can just use this time to think of your own story. But my family had just come back from visiting India. My father is from West Bengal, and uh, very near the Bangladesh border. My mother is from Scotland, I was born in England. We had just come back from visiting our family in India when a group of Indian mission missionaries who had just come back from India came to visit my church in Akron, Ohio. And my mother said, oh, go up to the front. You've just been to India, they are from India. You all have connections to the same place. They're gonna be talking about your fatherland. And so I went up to children's moment at the front of the church, all excited to meet these people who knew my homeland, or my fatherland anyhow. And the missionaries started talking about people from India, and they kept using the term they. And for the first time in my life in that church, in this country, in that church, in this country anyhow, I realized that while I was always gonna be a we in that congregation. I was also a they. So I'd like to invite you all to gather in groups of three in any way you wanna configure those groups and share with each other for the next few minutes an early memory you have related to race. I wanna start out by acknowledging some of you may have heard the fancy term intersectionality. Kimberly Crenshaw de uh, developed that term to describe a lived experience, uh, particularly, um, particularly in the wake of an experience that black women at a car company in Detroit experienced. Black men had fought for the right to be on the work floor and to have access to union jobs. White women had, been, had fought successfully to have access to the administrative jobs, the secretarial jobs, um, when black women said they were shut, off, shut out from both the factory floor and from the administrative jobs, the factory floor because they were women and the administrative jobs because they were black, the Supreme Court said, y you can't play both cards, right? And so they said, we are a doubly oppressed people. Intersectionality is about the intersections of, as one of my colleagues says, the different chains around my neck that weigh me down. And so in the midst of any conversation, I'm aware of the fact that I come with both marginality and with privilege. Um, I'm a US citizen, which makes my life a whole bunch easier on a whole bunch of fronts. I'm an immigrant and there are people with my exact same status who are currently being de uh, having their citizenship revoked and being sent back to other countries. That's a little bit of marginality. 
I'm very light-skinned. I have a whole bunch of privilege, even relative to the rest of my family. Um, I was raised with English as my first language, which opens a million doors uh, that other people don't have open to them. I am perceived as a straight person, and regardless of who I date, the way I am read in the world is as a straight person, which provides me lots of privileges. Um, as a woman, and as a woman of color, I experience marginality. All of us have a mixture of privilege and marginality, privilege and oppression, and all of those different things intersect with each other in the way that we're read in the world, in the opportunities that are made available to us, in the benefits that we carry with us from previous generations. All of those things are always true. And this series is focusing specifically on race. And so I wanted to name that those other things don't get erased, but the conversation that y'all are gonna be engaging in over the course of this semester is focusing particularly on race. And like I said, you all are gonna be working out the definition of race and, and racism. And the speakers that you're gonna experience are going to have different perspectives on that, right? So I just wanted to very briefly go over with you all the definition that my denomination works with as our working definition. Not because it's the only definition, not because it's the best definition, but because we need a shared language in order to be able to do the work of moving forward. And so we definitely didn't come up with it. We're not the only ones that use it. But I wanted you to know in this conversation, if I mention racism, here's what I mean by it. Racism equals race prejudice plus institutional and systemic power. A lot of times in the media, um, when people talk about racism, all they're talking about is race prejudice, right? So this definition's a little more expansive, and we often get pushed back on why we're not just using the definition everyone else uses. Before I get to that, I want to very briefly kind of go over the different components of that, just again, so you know what I'm talking about when I say this. Prejudice, what does it mean? Yeah, to prejudge. Is prejudice good or bad? Could be either. Could be either. Anybody think of any examples where prejudice might be a good thing? Prejudge a scorpion. Hmm? Prejudge a scorpion. Prejudge a scorpion. That looks like it could sting me. Yes. <laughs> that seems like a really reasonable one. I, I often talk about uh, most of us were raised not to take candy from strangers, right? That not all strangers are bad, but we were encouraged not to take candy from strangers. I've had some pushback on that from some colleagues who have pointed out the people who are most likely to harm children are people we know. So, so prejudice isn't necessarily rational, right? Uh, it often seems rational. It's rarely rational but can be good, can be bad. Y'all are theologians, so you know about God's prejudicial, uh, preferential option for the poor. That's prejudice. I got to hear Gustavo Gutierrez speak, and he said, we don't stand with the poor because the poor are good. We stand with the poor because God is good. God shows prejudice, unapologetically. Well, God doesn't have to apologize for much. Um, God shows prejudice. Prejudice can be good, can be bad, is not necessarily rational. I'm not even going to ask y'all what race is. Um, I'm just going to tell you that from the vantage point of my church, race is something that was very intentionally constructed, right? If any of you have heard of Bacon's Rebellion, I want to say 1676, I might have that wrong. Uh, but in the late 1600s, 
there was an uprising of white indentured servants and black people who were enslaved. I don't want to conflate those two things. The conditions of white indentured servants were bad, but their, um, their tenure as indentured servants, while it usually lasted through their entire lives, did not get passed on to their children. They're not to be conflated with each other, but both communities were struggling, and they came together and rose up against the white landowners, right? So a piece of history that we often don't learn about in this country is when um, white and black people both experiencing oppression saw enough similarity with each other and solidarity to rise up against the people who were harming them both. Right around the same time emerged this science of race where the arguments were made that white people were inherently superior, that black people were inherently inferior, um, along with other communities of color insofar as um, they needed to be talked about. And that legacy continues to shape the way we are in relationship with each other in this country to this day. And so when I'm talking about race, I'm talking about particularly how it was constructed in this country. And that for the past 400 years, we have been navigating um, those ever-changing categories, categories that change to benefit certain systems and structures. And another piece of that, that history that I hadn't learned until a few years ago when I started reading some indigenous histories was the quote-unquote science of race had already begun to creep into this country even at the time of Bacon's Rebellion because at the same time that um, the revolt of black people who had been enslaved and white indentured servants happened, they revolted against white landowners who were making them suffer and indigenous people because they had already been trained into the understanding that indigenous people were savages who were trying to harm them. That's the complexity of race that we live with in this country, and it has played itself out with every immigrant group that has come in. It has played itself out in all sorts of ways that you'll get to hear about over the course of the semester as well as next. So the way we define race is a social construct that intentionally creates hierarchies that divide us. Anybody want to name some institutions? Prison system. Prison system. Education system. Education, yep. Reservation. Reservation, yeah. Housing, yep. Seminaries. Seminaries. Mm -hmm. Education. The church. Lots of institutions and systems. Are institutions good or bad? Yes, that is the correct answer. <laughs> the purpose of institutions is to serve their members. The challenge is when institutions uh, at some point begin to seek to serve themselves, right? To perpetuate themselves rather than to serve, uh, serve people. And systems are when those institutions are connected to each other, right? So um, when the police department and uh, immigration and customs enforcement and the prison system and the school system are all working together, the prison industrial complex is, is a, a bigger system, right? How do you define power? Agency in the world, I don't know. Agency in the world's a good answer. Hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, pow power over might be described as control, right? The ability to control, control your own circumstances, control other people's circumstances. Power two is um, the access we have and potentially share, right? Yeah. 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 Right, right. Yeah, so power is often concentrated. 
which is exactly the point of this definition here. Um, so yeah, it's, it's about having access control um, to hmm, authority. Yep, exactly, exactly. Um, so all of the things that have been named here, that's power. So in this definition that, again, my church works with, the difference is race prejudice is something that all of us have been shaped by. I mean, all of us walked in here having been taught certain biases about other folks. We may have all transcended them. I'm sure you all have. I'm still working on mine. Um, but all of us have race prejudice. Uh, it's, it's in the air we breathe. The difference between race prejudice and racism is when race prejudice is paired with power held in institutions and systems. That's how racism plays itself out in our world. That might be a definition that's familiar to, it, it, to you. It may be a new one. But I wanted to share it with you just so you know what we work out of in my church. It's a definition that many uh, denominations are working with in our efforts to dismantle a culture of white supremacy. So that was just a backdrop to say, I think that this matters to the conversation, conversations that you're going to be engaged in over the course of this semester because Conversations are shaped by power. They're shaped by authority, they're shaped by access, they're shaped by control, and they're shaped by both power over and power to. Um, they're shaped by where power is concentrated. They are, power is always underlying every dialogue we have. It is why all of the prophetic books in the Hebrew Bible were written. It was because of the power dynamics that were playing themselves out in the ruling institutions and also in the culture, right? So when we move into the guidelines for conversation, we can't lose sight of power. What I'm gonna do is toss up onto the board some really basic working guidelines for any conversation. And then I'm going to have us do a little bit of small group work to expand that list based on the purpose of your time together this semester. So ground rules. And like I said, when you get into your small groups, you might discover that you want to tweak some of these. These are just a starting place that I have found useful for these kinds of conversations. I had already mentioned striving to live into a brave space. One of the agreed upon um, community processes at the Oakland Peace Center is because we have a very culturally diverse group of folks who are working together is engage with curiosity and appreciate diversity. And that doesn't mean, you know, Benetton ad diversity. It means we're going to see things different ways because of the ways the world has shaped us. And working hard to appreciate that diversity, um, working hard not to react with, why would you say that? But I'm interested in why you said that. Same question, just a different premise for it. Um, is easier in theory than in practice. I think one that many people are familiar is I statements. Rather than speaking on behalf of other people, we only speak for ourselves. And connected to that, and this is kind of a kindergarten level one, is don't assume. Um, in a world where, in a country where racism functions in the way it does, I think we are very often given the gift of not, rec not seeing uh, all white people as the same. We know that there's not an issue that all white, pe white people see, this, see the same way. There are still assumptions made that 
black people think this way, Latinos think this way, Asians think this way. Um, so working hard for all of us to not assume about each other, about each other's experiences, about each other's motives. One of my favorite ones, and this has a lot to do with power, um, is an acronym that my friends in 18 Million Rising do use, which is an Asian Pacific Islander activist group, is wait. Why am I talking? <laughs> I find that to be a really useful question to ask. Um, connected to that, there's three of these that I kind of link together. One diva, one mic, which just means we don't talk over each other. Whoever has the mic is the one who's speaking. And a third one, again, I see all three of these connected to each other. Be comfortable with silence. Because across cultural diversity, there are different amounts of time that people are often given to reflect before sharing a thought. Uh, one of my co-trainers lives on the Yakima Reservation, and he said whenever he has coffee with his next door neighbor, he knows to wait 60 seconds uh, before his colleague is going to respond to him. So my conversations with Dave, I come out of a culture where we talk over each other and that is totally acceptable. And I have discovered in my workplace that when I talk over other people, they do not find it acceptable. Uh, so I have to learn to be comfortable with silence as well. I already said that one. Yeah, okay, let me do this in a different order. Here's one that I think is connected to brave space. So I'm going to put it right here. Correct gently, but do correct. And that's actually a value I learned from the Gay Straight Alliance uh, youth program in the California schools. Correct gently, but do correct. And then the last one I want to share as a starting place for these conversation guidelines is expect and embrace a lack of resolution. This is a lifelong conversation and will not get wrapped up at the end of a session or the end of a semester or the end of seminary. Um, it is a lifelong process and some of us have been culturally shaped to expect things with a tidy bow on them, uh, an action plan, and things wrapped up. And that is not a viable way to stay in relationship and stay in the work together. So expect and embrace a lack of resolution. That's actually one that I learned from the South Asian Young Adult Radical Activist Program that uh, I am a part of. And it is very hard for young radical activists who want to change the world to be told, we won't get this fixed by the end of a five-day program. Uh, so that's one that we recite as a mantra uh, during our youth camp every year. So these are a starting place for a conversation. What I want to invite us to do at this point, to do a little bit of practicing, is And I want to preface this by saying, again, I'm about to ask you to do something that might be uncomfortable, that might feel like a stretch. And I'm going to invite you to engage that with the trust or the hope that it serves to build us together as a stronger community. What I'd like to ask you to do is to get into small groups into two groups to discuss 
what you think would, it would be helpful to tweak, what you think is missing, what would help you grow in your work in this semester, what would take care of, honor, and protect your classmates. And the way I'd like you to break up is for white folks to have that conversation on this side of the room and people of color to have that conversation on this side of the room so that you can share with each other what will be helpful to you in the process of being in relationship with each other over the course of the semester. So that you can have a little space to have some on honest conversation about fears, challenges, and hopes that you bring. So I'm going to invite you carrying that definition of how power plays itself out in conversations about race to gather white people on this side of the room, people of color on this side of the room, to talk about how you'd like to tweak this list, what you'd like to add from it, add to it, so that you can have a healthier community conversation in the weeks to come. It is always a calculated risk doing caucusing for such a short period of time because there's so much, right? There's so much to talk about. There's so much to process together. Um, and we don't get a lot of opportunities to do it. We do it informally. Um, sometimes we do it informally without even realizing that's what's happening. Uh, I know this as somebody who passes enough that I sit at some all-white tables and all of a sudden I hear a lot of they's coming up in the conversation because people have forgotten there's a person of color at the table. Um, so I know informal caucusing without people even realizing it is going on happens. Um, and it happens informally in communities of color as well as in white communities. But that intentional who are we together and what do we need to talk about so that we can be together, all of us, isn't something we get to do a lot. And it's hard and awkward sometimes. And I have never been a part of really successful justice work that didn't involve a little bit of intentional gathering of white folks to talk through their stuff and people of color to talk through our stuff so that we can be in better relationship with each other. So it's also always a horrible idea to conclude with caucusing. So I know that that wasn't enough time. And I also want us to get some time in our small groups together where we get to practice some of the guidelines we've come up with. So what were a few of the things that came up, tweaks that y'all would like to make, additions you'd like to make, and just questions for the room that may not end up being guidelines, but might be important stuff for us to name before you embark on this journey together. What came up in your groups? Someone in our group um, wanted to emphasize adding total honesty to brave space oh, yeah. correctly gender, gen uh, correcting. Yes. Thank you. Uh, one thing that came up in our group was don't, not assuming that one person from a certain group speaks for all. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It would be interesting, I don't know if it's a counterpoint, but mm -hmm. addition to that is that in our group it was that, um, in response to the I statement mm -hmm. and the Black assumption is that um, there is some experiential communal reality mm -hmm. um, that we would want to see acknowledge and affirm. Yeah, I. I am definitely shaped by a culture that places a priority on community before individual. Uh, and that sometimes gets lost in this process. I appreciate that. Thank you. 
That's a complex tension to hold. Yeah. I think that's a question for this group to hold. I train anti-racism trainers. Uh, that's my favorite thing these days. I've been doing so much anti-racism training that I, I've run out of energy for it. So my favorite thing to train to do, to do is to train the next generation instead. And when I talk with the trainers of color, I always say, our stories as trainers are an important lubricant for the process. And you don't, do it, you don't owe it to anyone to re-traumatize yourself for the sake of someone else's learning. And that is also a complex tension to hold in the midst of these conversations. The UCC has been, United Church of Christ has been involved in a lot of um, sacred conversations on race over the last five years. And they offer these two reflections that may be valuable to the group or may not. Listen deeply to and honor the feelings of anger, pain, and joy in those who have been the targets of racism. Listen deeply to and honor the feelings of shame, fear, and grief in those who are waking up to the reality of racism in our churches, neighborhoods, and nation. And do not let the conversation stop with an exploration of individual feelings, attitudes, and behaviors, but continue on to examine the realities of cultural and institutional racism. That's not for an academic conversation. That's for a conversation of community. And this is both. Uh, and that's another complexity to be holding on to, is you're doing deep, rigorous academic work. Um, you owe it to each other not to re-traumatize each other. Feelings are going to show up. All of that's true. So the thing that had come up in your group was around that question of how do we protect and honor each other in the midst of this work? And there might be a better way of phrasing that if anybody has a suggestion. Like I said, I always tell my trainers of color not, we don't owe it to anybody to re-traumatize ourselves for the sake of the work. But I'm just going to put up the question, how do we honor and protect each other? Yeah. Right around that same thought. Yeah. So if we were to begin with the idea that racism is a equal opportunity offender, and um, in that light, we're able to recognize the fact that, that if racism was understood in its fullness, then we could all begin to see how we've all been offended. We've all been wounded by this. There has been a crime committed against humanity through this process of racism. And so really, what that would do in my mind is create an even level playing field, a beginning where we can all start here and just say, this is where we are. And we can move more compassionately and give us something to use, to have more compassion for that now. Thanks. Thanks. And you were going to reply. Yeah, I, um, well, just to this question here, and I kind of talked about it in the book that it's just like moving with someone, even in a social uh, situation, you want to kind of qualify the person. For you. A lot of times we just go in, but we don't, we don't know that we probably are um, being, uh, you know, causing trauma to someone. I want to qualify the person, get to know what, you know, um, what makes them what makes them sick, what makes them not. Kind of just asking questions or just going through it with, uh, you know, uh, asking questions and, and, and you know, being inquisitive. Yeah. Not just going in as if uh, they like the exact same thing. 
yes. That's a profoundly pastoral, um, that's a profoundly pastoral way of engaging that is don't just plunge in, um, get to know, ease into getting to know each other so that you can figure out what the threshold is. Yeah, and recognize. I really appreciate um, that naming of, the theologically, racism does damage to all of us. It damages our basic humanity. It damages that part of us that is in the image of God. And I want to make sure that we don't lose in the midst that racism's design is to provide privileges to some at the cost um, of real harm to others. And I think both, this is what's great about working with theologians, is y'all can hold all of those tensions. Um, and both of those things, I think, are very true. And, and for all of us to acknowledge, this does do damage to all of us, and that's why we're all in this conversation. Uh, there's an indigenous theologian, sorry, there's an indigenous activist in Australia whose name escapes me now, who says, if you're showing up for my liberation, I don't need you. But if you're showing up because your liberation is wrapped up in mine, then we can work together. Um, and, it, and that's why all of us are in this room. We're in this room as theologians. We're in this room as people who care about justice. And we're in this room for our liberation as well as each other's. Yeah, I appreciate that. I sus oh yeah, we'll take one last one. Please, John. Um, so these are kind of uh, intertwined. Um, having uh, posture of grace with one another as we're all like learning people and changing people um, as we engage these difficult topics. And I, I say that like, could, I guess we'll use the parking lot metaphor, like we all go out and talk about these things and like this person said that, this person said this. And I wonder if just having like a posture of like, you know, like we're all learning together and um, have being compassionate, uh, what Alonzo shared. Yeah. And also, um, I wonder if you had some advice about when do we correct? Um, so do correct, but do we correct immediately or do we? Um... Yeah, I mean, I think all of you know that there's, there's a certain amount of kind of guesswork involved in that because it's so situational. Um, I'm in a community of fundraisers of color and we are from very different cultural backgrounds and we uh, sometimes step on each other's toes. And we use that really rudimentary um, high school youth group rule of oops and ouch, right? Where if somebody says something that we find problematic, all we have to say is ouch. And that person, whether they understand or not, um, will say oops. And that's kind of a, a commitment to having a one-to-one -one conversation afterwards to figure out what happened, um, if it's going to disrupt the flow of the conversation. Um, some of you have done youth groups, so you already know that one, but I'm just going to put it up there. Um, and there are times when it's important for the whole group to be a part of that conversation and to say, I don't want to throw things off too much. I really need to name. Like, here's how this was hurtful. Here's how this was problematic. I was in a group setting recently where a colleague of mine made a joke about how highly sensitive the youth activists we were with were so that they were going to experience the t-shirt sizes as sizest. Um, and one of the women said, you know what? That was a fat phobic comment. That wasn't OK. Just right in the middle of the conversation. And he was committed enough to this kind of process that he said, I hear that, and I'm sorry. And they were able to continue. So she was able to recognize it in the moment, name it in the moment, and he was able to acknowledge it because he recognized he was functioning out of a certain level of privilege in that conversation. And that's a big part of 
navigating this and why I went through that definition of racism is power is, that's the last thing I'm gonna add on the list. Power is always functioning um, in all of these conversations. And part of the purpose of this semester is to become aware of how it's functioning, where it's functioning. And that's gonna be kind of the spiritual discipline part of this semester in your conversation groups, I think. So with that, this is probably gonna be a growing list, but I'd like to invite you all to start practicing this with each other by getting into your small groups in just a moment to discuss what Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21, has to say to you in your conversations about race, ethnicity, and religion. Anybody want me to give you that passage one more time? <laughs> Luke 12, verses 13 through 21. What does that passage have to do with race, ethnicity, and religion? You have a whole seven minutes to discuss it. Go ahead and get into your small groups now. So this was a ridiculously short teaser of being in conversation together. My fantasy is you're so excited that you all go out to lunch together in groups to continue the theological discussion, uh, but that is not mandatory. Uh, I am grateful for the chance to be with you at the beginning of this. I really think that Chinwa Achebe, the Nigerian author, talks about the need for a balance of stories. There are powerful stories in this room. There are powerful witnesses, testimonies, teachings that are going to be coming to you all of this semester. And you all get to be a part of balancing the stories for the liberation of God's earth. I'm grateful to you for taking that task so seriously. First and foremost, we love you. Hard semester had this a hard year had this but uh, a rich fulfilling year and so um, take the space to be gentle with one with one another and with yourselves to um, challenge yourselves to grow and be stretched uh, in this room and on this campus um, and always be mindful that we're trying to modulate our privilege and power and uh, for the sake of liberation so um, we will reconvene next week where we will have Sarah Sanderson Dowdy, Dr. Sander Sarah Sanderson Dowdy, who's the pastor of um, St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church in Portland, Oregon, and she'll be talking about the theology of sin and racism as the, um, a part of a theology of sin. Please be mindful that you have a reading for that lecture. Um, there's an excerpt from Robin D'Angelo's um, White Fragility that will be crucial for uh, our time together next week, and that can be found on Google. Uh, so we'll go down to peace.